Eric. Omar. We didn't want to have to do this. No, it's... I don't know what you had planned to say, but I think the only way we can address this is is head on. Yep. Um, and I think instead of us... You know, sometimes we will... We'll act as the messenger. We'll repeat things other people have said. Sure. Um, but I think at this point, just so people realize that we're not being hyperbolic. People do say the things about iron culture that we say they say. Yeah. We should be playing the actual clips from, unfortunately, people we thought who are our allies, the Stronger by Science podcast. Um, if I remember our own canon correctly, right. that's where we, where we left it. Am I wrong, Omar? We were allies with iron culture. Um, I mean, I, I don't, I'm so con confuddled here. Yeah. I'm using words like confuddled, which aren't words. No, and I'm it's calling a word. It's canon. A, the Stronger by Science podcast. We're always culture. friends with Eurasia. That has been since time immemorial. Uh, you're correct. The, the only thing I am absolutely clear on is you're correct with what you just said. Yeah. I, we, we, we came out of a, 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 of, a, of, of a dark age. Yeah. You know, we recently had a episode totally not forced on us celebrating Sigma Nutrition Radio. Both of us came alive away yeah. from that. And I was actually there in person yeah. with that crew. I'm not going to name any names. And the point being is those fences are mended. Yeah. Um, I keep my side of that fence high just for safety. Right. But the point is, is we're allies with Sigma Nutrition. Right. And we have been allies with Stronger by Science as far as I understood it. But unfortunately, pulling the rug right out from under us, mm -hmm. that has changed. No, Eric, this is one of those classic uh, Machiavellian twists of treachery that we should really have come to expect. Um, it's something that if those that follow, you know, Star Trek or whatnot, this is a Romulan move. This is a classic either Romulan, Cardassian move. Um, we knew it all along. We, we like to believe, Eric always said to me, Omar, principle of charity. Yeah, you might be right. X person, not stronger by science, but X person is clearly a piece of shit. But at the same time, we should give them, you know, their fair ability to articulate their thoughts. Let's not judge. And you were right, Eric. I think that's a noble position. You already said, you know, steel man, someone's argument. And we agreed on that. And then for it to come full circle and for them, which we're about to hear, to say blatantly what we've been alleging they've been saying all this time so people could understand that we've been right all along. Well, there's a small aspect of vindication, but there's also a profound sense of disappointment and what we thought mm. were our friends. Yeah. So I, th I think we, we don't, I don't, I don't want to preload yeah. the audience's reaction to this any more than I need to. I'm just going to play it. And yeah. this is the 100th episode of the Stronger by Science podcast. This could have been a time for truth, reconciliation, moving forward and coming together, yeah. but they chose violence. And here's where we're at. Go ahead. This 100th episode, uh, people were asking me, Eric, is this the first ever fitness podcast to reach 100 episodes? And actually the answer is no. Um, now we were the first podcast and by default the first fitness podcast, but then as we know, a lot of copycat podcasts kind of popped up. Iron Culture is one of them. There's been a few others. Unbelievable, what, unbelievable. What, what do you do with that? What well, do you do with that, Omar? I think uh, the only thing that's sensible is to c declare outright war, um, to tell the iron culturists to burn the ships. This is not unlike, you know, the kinslaying that occurred on Middle Earth, Feanor, when he was pursuing Morgoth and the Silmarils that were rightfully his and his kin, and the Teleri elves, because people like to think evidence based community, E elves e we're all similar elves we're all trying to contribute to make the world a better place make it more beautiful sing songs so luvatar is going to you know praise us so on and so forth and that might be true on the surface but these teleri elves when fainor was rightfully pursuing morgoth he demanded use of their ships and they refused now as i said before they were his Silmarils. this was the beauty of the earth and by them refusing, he was left with no choice but to engage in an act that many viewed as being horrific. But really, when we contextualize what was occurring, and that is him pursuing those gems that had the power of the earth, and the elves refused them, yes, it's kin slaying, or some might say outright war, but we look at this as a necessary move. And in times of, uh, let's let's be honest here, incredible struggle, in times of uncertainty, volatility, um, you must make a, a, a firm stance. And I think us calling it out right now that we're not going to stand by and take this you know, lightly is 
but a minor uh, declaration on our part. There's much more to follow. And I, I know what some people are thinking. You know, it's, it's, it's hard not to get wrapped up into what other people say. And you might be thinking, wait a minute, how can you guys be so outraged? I mean, you literally call this podcast the Macro Factor podcast and you call Eric Trexler the Macro Factor guy. Yeah. And that may sound like that's us taking a shot at them yep. or being derisive or sardonic. Yep. Um, but I think it's really important that we recognize that despite being on quote unquote team good guys, evidence-based community, putting out good information, they do know what they are. Yep. And they know that they are a, a force for evil disguised in the charade of science. Because in this same 100th episode, right. they blatantly admit what the, the the primary podcast, the Stronger by Science podcast is. So I just want to play this clip, this clip by Greg just to show that we're not repeating, we're, we're not slandering them. We're just literally repeating the way they see themselves right. in this world. Right. So this isn't, you know, misinformation. This is, this is intentional, you know, uncharitable destruction of the society we're in yeah. that they do on a, not even a weekly basis, which any good podcast, you know, it's weekly, it's every weekly. single Monday, right? Every so single. anyway, I'll, I'll, I'm not going to get too hyped up here, but I'm just going to play this clip. <laughs> it's getting hot This is here, Greg man. Knuckles talking about how he sees the Stronger by Science podcast uh, in relation to the fireside chats. I would push back against your characterization. It's more like when... Uh, you know, after someone sells out and they, they do projects, like maybe they make movies with like big budgets for a big audience or whatever, but they still want to make art on the side. They want to do something for them where it's not just about the reach and the paycheck. It's about trying to make something truly great. That's what, that's what the fireside chats are. Um, and you know, some people don't appreciate. Eric, they, li I mean, I, you, you can't make this stuff up. You know, we are not saying anything that is, that is controversial here. The controversy comes from the fact that we have to share space with a podcast um, that acknowledges it is a, it is a corporate sellout. Yeah. That they're so bogged down by their own uh, demagoguery that they need to actually create some artistic outlet for themselves. When we know from the start, this is a money losing investment. It's not even an <laughs> investment. It's just an excuse for me and Omar to hang out and talk about stuff we like with you, dear listener. Um, and for that, they come at our souls. Because we are an existential threat to how they see uh, the podcast science complex to exist yeah. uh, and the way they are trying to enslave and chain this world, which we are rallying against. So I don't think we need to say much more because I think Greg and Eric said it all right there with their slanderous attacks against us that were unprovoked simply because we actually do have an artistic center while they're aware that they've purposely abandoned that in order to pursue profit and uh you know you do what you will with that eric there are those that might come at us and say these remarks are caustic that they're downright harmful to the community and to them what we would say in turn would be if you saw a dear friend someone that you grew up with that meant a lot to you that was contributing a lot in a space and if you were to see them years later suddenly appear before you gone is the glimmer in their eyes the soul that you could see through that piercing gaze in those you know pearly blue eyes and instead you kind of just see this empty suit this this soulless vessel in front of you um, and you understood right at that moment that they had exchanged the most valuable thing in the world their immortal soul for a few shekels would you not be outraged too it's perfectly normal to be incensed when you see such a uh, you know, transmorgification, let's say. So it's a, it's a downward uh, transformation that occurred. It's something actually uh, quite horrific. You would call it out. If you cared as a friend, Eric, I think you would call it out too. And no one likes saying these things, right? It's like when a, when, when a parent punishes a child, not physically, to be clear, verbally, go to your room, they're not proud of it. They like sure some of them uh, might think this is necessary but part of them feels deep down inside this was tough this was difficult i don't like to see my child not smile but they know it's necessary so by bringing up these topics by us playing these i don't even know how to describe these i'm, I'm still i'm kind of speechless right now i'm like you threw a 
we I knew this was coming because you mentioned it, Eric, and I know we have this uh, monster of an episode, but we have to talk about it. And w- the thing about Iron Culture, unlike that scripted uh, telecast that's basically just a one hour by the beat, minute 14 is the third, you know, inclusion of Macro Factor. Like it's very formulaic. This is raw, uh, it's more like jazz and provisory of two just humans communicating with one another. And kind of the tonic we say to each other before we begin on air stay human, right? Right? Like be be someone, be like be an actual uh, 3D human being, and so it's tough. Um, I I will pray, um, but I know they've made such remarks again. You know, uh, uh, anyways, I don't even know what to say, Eric. I'm I'm done. I, I want to move to the the topic, man. Well, I do, and and I think to sum it up, we're really happy that you guys are on your 100th episode. So congratulations <laughs> and big shout out to the Stronger by Science podcast. Yeah. Uh, I'm a regular listener, and yeah. I look forward to working with you guys on a regular basis, like I always do with Mass. Um, so yeah, what's our topic of the day, Omar? Yeah, Eric, uh, let me also just echo and say that, that, uh, mainly because I fear change, but their podcast and Sigma Nutrition are legitimately the only two that I'll check in with. There are many yep. other fantastic, like that's not, I'm not actually trying to, to be serious for a second, throw any other podcast under the bus, but the quality is just so high that uh, when I go for my walk, you know, I go to the bank when I was like 45 minutes, I'll plug it in. Uh, so congratulations on making it to a hundred, um, it, it, you'll you'll see once you reach a thousand because we're well on that trajectory. Um, I think that I think that's the rarefied air. Like, is there a podcast that's reached a thousand in the fitness space that hasn't sold their soul? Fitness space, fitness, definitely space. not. Because okay. I think I think I think we established with the Sigma Nutrition one, they're approaching five hundred. Yeah, and uh, you know, Danny never had a soul in the first place, so he didn't. They have not lost their soul. Wow. Physically impossible. Yeah, fi- so, yeah, yeah, yeah. That, yeah that's yeah. that is an interesting philosophical question. Now that we did, if if folks look at the timer on the podcast, they'll notice it's basically uh, twelve minutes, right? Which is our obligatory ten to twelve minutes. That is something for those that love the banter. We'll give you the ten to twelve minutes. Kai, shout out to Kai. We have timestamps now, so it, it actually has emboldened us because we know we we've said this many times now, at least eight or ten times in the last several episodes. Look at the timestamps. You don't want to listen at a particular part? Jump right ahead. And this one is interesting, Eric, because this this is actually going to be, I think, a very interesting uh, conversation. We're talking in particular kind of about uh, deloads, tapering, the nutrition therein. Because Eric, I'm Omar. I got to interrupt you. Again. Oh, no. I'm sorry. Oh no. What up? I actually, I actually do have to. Uh, not only did I start this <laughs> podcast by by calling someone out for calling us out, but I actually do owe two people, actually three people, including you, an apology. Oh no. So, uh, what happened? So, so as you know, um, we have the images that we create for the Iron Culture podcast yes. that we put out. Um, early on, I sent you a Dropbox folder, Picks of Eric, or yes. Eric Picks, I can't remember what I titled it. Yep. Um, and then you sent that to Severin. Severin was making our images for a while, and now Kai has them. It's yep. been passed around the internet, and yep. the three of you yep. uh, have had access to this Dropbox folder. Um, and... That folder did contain one other folder within it, offstage picks new, um, that I did not necessarily curate as well as I should have. Uh, for those who don't know, uh, Alberto Nunez, been on the podcast. Um, he has always been my coach as I go through contest preps. And in 2019, uh, there were a number of check ins that I did while traveling, did not have my, say, posing trunks with me. Oh, okay. And, right. you know, to show him. You know, some my my degree of leanness. Yeah, there were a few instances of showing glute striations, but there were no posing trunks. Right, and I accidentally left those pictures yeah. in that folder. Yeah, so I do have to apologize. This is a, an inappropriate thing in many ways. That you, my friend, my colleague. Yeah. Um, we don't have an HR department yet. We probably should get one now that I've harassed you. Yeah. Um, but Kai is, you know, my master student, and. Uh, I'm not sure if I'm going to keep, keep, if I'll keep, keep be working at AUT or at least being his supervisor. Uh, honestly, it's it's on Kai. Kai, you know, you have full permission if you need to uh, seek seek punitive damages against me or or see if you want to get me fired or, or deal with that. But um, there was a, uh, a striated glute that was not yeah. intended to be disclosed and also Severin. If that's the reason why uh, you're no longer with us, I, I sincerely apologize. So I just want to put that out there. Um, it's just my due diligence. I learned this only recently. Yep. And it was an error, but it's still no excuse. So here we are. And I I'm an imperfect man who's always seeking to grow. 
And I, uh, that's all I'm going to say on that, Omar, because I think anything else, I probably need to spend more time working on myself before I uh, speak again on this topic. You know, I will, I will say, uh, I'm going to take a lateral step here and give a commentary uh, of critiques of capitalism, our favorite aspect of this podcast, and just say HR in general is such a morbid concept when you think about it, like really think about it, because as you would say, ostensibly on the surface, human resources is there for the employees, but anything that's said in the HR department is then uh, transferred over to the higher ups of the executives and whatnot. If someone, if there's some legitimate concern, so anything that you say, you think it's for your own benefit, but it's basically it's kind of damage control for anything getting out of turn. So if there's a serious incident or whatnot, so on and so forth, their job. Oh, so we definitely need yeah, to because we, no, we, I, I I don't really want to get fired. That was a fake no, apology. No, I just so need that, to. So that's just, I need damage control. Can we get one of those? So the beauty, yeah, the, the beauty of something like HR is that it serves as a proxy. Right, like so, it's like something terrible happened. Well, we have this thing to address it, but this thing is oriented in favor of the company at all times. It's not like this impartial third party thing that if the company's found at fault, it's like, guess what? Like, someone does something, it's like, well, you really have to pay for this. It's like, what's the least? Here's a perfect example. Like, I was reading a few articles on this, this is just amusing, but it's like, hey, uh, as workers, collective bargaining agreement, we want to increase like our salaries, it's been like unfair, this and that. HR communicated HR, HR talks to executives. They're like, there's no fucking way. They're like, okay, so what we're going to do, we've heard you, you're overworked. We put in the break room a massage chair and you guys can go in and use it anytime you want. So like, they're basically, they're the bearer of bad news, but they're framed in a way that we're here for you, but it's really, you know, in a way that the company doesn't get like uh, really in trouble. A, that's ingenious and we need to get that. Uh, B, Brandon, if you could remove the entire apology and yep. everything that I said, yep. and uh, I'll just direct Kai to our forthcoming HR department. Right. Same with Severin. Yep. Same with you, actually, yep. although you seem fine with it. I was completely maybe fine. I need to speak, maybe I need to speak to HR about that. Uh, but I think that way, <laughs> nothing changes. This keeps going on, and everyone is, I don't know if everyone's happy, but yeah. we're protected in our positions of power at the top of the pyramid, yep. which is ultimately for the benefit of everyone, we assume, without asking. So I think we're good. No. Uh, so Eric, I am going to get to the topic then, uh, only because I'm acutely aware that we said we're going to keep this one focused because it is a nuanced conversation. It is something that I think will apply to a certain subset that are listening, but it also is very interesting to me getting into the weeds of some of these conversations because you could talk about things like you know uh, deficit surplus or like what one needs to eat at particular points in time. But then there becomes uh, there's a time and place where some of these conversations uh, are very important, but they're not discussed. And I'm going to frame this first from a strength perspective to give a little bit of an anecdote, uh, Eric, because when you brought this up, I found this supremely interesting as it relates to hypertrophy, DLOs, the nutrition therein. And basically, I'm going to outline it to you as follows. Typically, I have been doing this for the last little bit. And when you presented it to me, I finally identified the smoking gun as to why I've not been making all the gains I want. I want you to know that's how I internalize what you communicated to me. But something that I've done as it relates to strength training that I like is that I'll do a block or I'll do two blocks. And so I'll build up, uh, then I work back down, build up, so on and so forth. And in that time, I'm eating around maintenance. It might honestly be in a slight surplus, right? Because I do want to accumulate a little bit of mass. Cool, whatever. And so over a period of 10 to 12 weeks, there might be a point in time where I'm probably four or five pounds up from the initial weight. So cool. In two to three months, I'm gaining about, you know, one to maybe two pounds per month. Cool. And then after that, typically after two blocks or three blocks, so anywhere between like eight to 12 weeks or therein, I will do two weeks Well, I'll then do a more firm deload. So on the 13th week, like these are all rough numbers, but just to give a, sure. an example here, Eric. And then what I'll do, I'll lower the calories. I'll do a little bit of a uh, weight loss aspect. Nothing great, like shed one or two pounds, right? But I'll lower my calories because it is a deload. It's not as strenuous on my body. I had just already fat accumulated fatigue. I'm trying to dissipate it. The calories aren't so low that it's going to affect my performance in that moment or anything in the new block. But basically, a uh, deload, low calories, week one, reintroduction week, I will have still lower calories, but then I'll build it back up. But the whole time, basically, after you know building up building back down i have lost a few pounds i've kept a few of those pounds i'm training it's not detrimental to my performance and then you hit me with the sizzler mm. then i don't know what to think and i'm questioning if the reason why i'm not ronnie coleman is this i mean it's, it's it certainly could be confusing <laughs> um <laughs> the other <laughs> the other part might be the fact that you didn't have the same parents as ronnie coleman um and you haven't trained 
eaten or really done any of the same <laughs> things that Ronnie Coleman has done, except being generally in the, the same lifting space for some time. Possibilities. Um, yeah. And maybe the fact that you didn't need enough on your deloads. So Thank you. Uh, I would also put forth that you might have, if you had corrected this earlier, you might have been on Olympia stage with Ronnie Coleman, as well as at least one out of five body composition interested people on the internet. Because this is a really common question. Yeah. So this might be the thing holding back all of the potential Mr. Or, and Ms. Olympias that we've, we've missed out on. So on, on, honestly though, but seriously, like how often do you see the question on like online forums or groups or just do you get it? Sometimes I'm sure you get asked questions just like I do. Uh, should I cut my calories on a deload? And I think the, the, the premise is generally sound. The idea is that you're doing a deload, so your calorie expenditure is less because you're doing less volume typically. Um, and you're not, it's not a stimulus to induce you know, adaptation. It's a stimulus to, a sufficient stimulus just to kind of hold steady and reduce fatigue. It's like a maintenance stimulus and less calories. So if I wasn't a surplus, if I did gain anything, it wouldn't be muscle and it's easier to be in a surplus and burning less calories. I would just put on body fat I'm afraid of gaining body fat. That's counter to my goals. I don't want to do that. So should I cut my calories and by how much? And that's a really, really common question. And I think the answer to it is, well, there's, there's two layers. First, we have to think about like, well, what the heck are, like, like what is a deload, hmm. right? Who is doing it? Why are we doing it? And what are the assumptions related to it? And I think probably tangentially, there's, there's worth talking about other deload-esque scenarios hmm. that might be useful probably more so to strength athletes, like yeah, intro weeks yep. uh, or, or tapers, which come before either testing or competition. And deloads, obviously strength athletes use them as well, but I think if we talk about them from the perspective of like hypertrophy and physique development, I think we can think about them differently than a intro or a taper. So there's that conversation, like, well, what are we trying to achieve and what is actually happening during a taper, maybe, yep. uh, which I will admit does come from the fact that the last duo episode we had before the Ben House episode we just had, I butchered two studies. I ended up looking into them more deeply, and I think they do apply to this conversation, and you'll hear a, a more accurate take on them in this one. <laughs> so this is the apology tour for me on this episode, folks, um, which won't make any sense because Brandon definitely cut out that last bit that you didn't hear, which didn't happen. Eric, speak pause. to the HR department. Pause. Yes. This is why you're such a hunk. So you felt this is this is the correct timeline of what just uh, occurred, folks. So we basically shat on Stronger by Science jokingly. Eric felt so yes. terrible. He threw himself under the bus over this whole alleged incident that didn't take place. But as a means of like, I feel terrible. I got to throw myself under the bus. Now he's bringing up these two studies that you know no one was going to check. Just to further from like a moral standpoint than from a scientific, a scientific standpoint to check him. Away you go. This self-flagellation, like, Don't it's you not necessary. Don't you It's, not, it's you, not necessary, you, sir. How dare you psychoanalyze <laughs> but go me ahead. live on the air yeah. completely inaccurately. <laughs> <laughs> but you, you were saying, so two studies. Correct. So yep. there, there, there's um, there's a couple. Of, so there was there was the two studies I referenced two podcast episodes ago. One of them actually did observe uh, delayed hypertrophy in a certain context, which I think is relevant, which we should talk about. Uh, and another one is the kind of faded, which some people are aware of, like high volume study that came out of um, Dr. Mike Roberts' lab. Uh, Cody Hahn was involved in it. Uh, there was a review on it uh, of it on Stronger by Science, and they had like this increasing. Uh, like increase in sets in the high volume group. And that's been reanalyzed and recently published in, in March. And the reason I bring up these two studies is because they're examples of overreaching followed by detraining or what could be considered like a really aggressive deload time off. Yep. So I think it's important to understand like what, what do we understand about what happens during deloads? What do we understand that happens during tapers? Because it's a little different. Yep. And you know, then what's an intro week? Like what are those? And then once we get a full picture of that, then we can figure out, well, okay, if this is what we're trying to accomplish, the reason we'd use it, and what happens, what would make sense to do nutritionally? And then, honestly, the second question, it always comes down to pragmatism, which is, you know, the application of this data, is how much does this even matter? Mm -hmm. Like, what kind of an energy, you know, difference are we talking about anyway in the first place? And then we can kind of wrap it up. So, that's what I want to talk about. What the heck are deloads? Yep. And then, tangentially, Taper, tapers as well as uh, intro blocks or weeks, I should say. And then what's the energy cost and the differences between these? And therefore, what should we do based on that? Um, because I think like the logic is sound. If you were to say, hey, 
I'm not creating a stimulus. It's a deload, right? I'm just dumping fatigue. I'm doing significantly less volume. I'm doing less energy expenditure. So therefore, I should cut calories. Energetically, that is a sound argument. But I think we have to ask ourselves, like, why are we doing a deload? And ostensibly, I'm bringing it back for you. Let's grab a word. Uh, the reason you would be doing a deload if you're doing things in a, from a kind of quote unquote optimal perspective, which is going to be the assumption I make based upon someone asking this question, because yep. it's, it's, it's yeah. splitting hairs, right? Yep. Yep. Um, you're deloading because you were overreaching, right? So if we kind of go back to the very basic concept of that, that there are two factor model, fitness and fatigue. The idea is that if you are pursuing, you know, hypertrophy or strength at a level that you're trying to optimize that, that process of making progression, you're going to have to do, you're, you're sometimes going to dip into creating too much fatigue, your performance is going to dip, and it'll be challenging to keep inducing an overload that you can express, and eventually that could lead to non-functional overreaching or overtraining without some way of mitigating that stress. This is basically a non-issue if you're doing like a moderate volume three times per week program, right? right? You have more days off per week than you have days on. Sure. And there's that probably might be all you need as, an, as, as a beginner. But as you become an intermediate and you're trying to maintain the highest rate of gains you can get, you know, if you look at surveys of bodybuilders and powerlifters, most of them are training four to six days a week, yep. right? So more days out of the week are, are training days than non-training days. And ul ultimately what happens is that you get to the point where the between session training fatigue bleeds over between weeks. You know, day one, week one, day one, week two, day one, week three, you start to feel a little bit more beat up, beat up. And sometimes you might even see that your performance plateaus or even regresses a little bit. And that's basically the definition of overreaching. So what do you do? You do something to dump fatigue and that's called a deload. So the assumption of a deload is that there was an overreaching period beforehand, right? So what we know very confidently in the literature is that overreaching followed by time off or a taper results in increases in performance. This has been well established in the tapering research. It's been well established in a number of studies on resistance training. Like you can see an increase in strength if you just give the, the participants a little bit of time off. It doesn't even need to be like a true full on taper. You know, you train them for seven weeks, the eighth week it has one, one training day that's easy, second training day that's easy, and then the third training day is actually the testing day. So it's really not even a full deload week, right, compared to what might be done in practice. And time and time again, when they do the time, time series uh, data collection points, you can see that their strength will actually be a little bit higher than it was right after the training. So this idea that dumping the fatigue you know, results in the ability to express more performance. It's been shown. I don't think it's worth me citing a lot of studies because uh, there's, there's numerous ones for performance. But the real question is, is that true for morphological adaptations? Is that true for hypertrophy? Um, and there has been there is some data on this, and the reason why I was diving into it again is that is one of those Bjornsson studies I brought up last time. I didn't go into the specific details on this last time, but I will now. So there was the study by in 2018 by Bjornsson, delayed, important word, myonuclear addition, myofiber hypertrophy, and increases in its strength with high-frequency, low-load blood flow restricted training to volitional failure. And the title kind of tells you right there that, hey, we saw you know, uh, indications of improved hypertrophy potential, if you will, you know, myonuclear addition. We saw myofiber hypertrophy. That's specifically biopsying, uh, you know, a little section of the muscle and finding that different muscle fibers had increased in diameter, increased in size. So the, the fibers themselves had gotten bigger in a delayed, you know, aspect and also that we saw increases in strength. Now, the interesting thing though in the study is that they also measured whole muscle changes. Okay, so taking a step back, planting a seed with the title, what was actually done in the study is they took untrained individuals and they had them in two blocks of five days, trained seven times. So that means two of those days, they trained twice a day. So they trained once a day, three days in a row, twice a day for two days in a row. So just five days of training, 10 days off, five days of training again, doing multiple sets of blood flow restricted leg extension exercise. Okay, untrained people. So they dumped basically a whole lot of training stress into them and then gave them time off and did it again and saw what happened. And not only did they do biopsies, but they also did MRI and ultrasound. And the ultrasound assessments of muscle thickness happened at the same time points as the biopsies. So we can see the discrepancy between myofiber hypertrophy, so looking at how much of the actual type one and type two fibers grow versus whole muscle changes in muscle thickness. 
And I think this is a really interesting finding. So when you look at the data on the myofiber hypertrophy, you basically see that there's even a mild regression in size after the first overreaching block. So yeah, you take untrained people, you train them seven times in five days, the muscle damage was actually probably counterproductive. Um, then you give them the 10 days off, you bring them back in. Now they've got that repeated bout effect that protects them against that severity of the damage. They do it again. And now we don't see significant hypertrophy after that block until 10 days later. Mm -hmm. And at the 10 days afterwards, there's actually a significant increase in type one fiber uh, diameter, which is what I, what I shared last or two, or two episodes ago uh, after I corrected myself because I confused it with another study and it almost was significant for type two fiber growth. So basically what we see is a delayed increase in myofiber hypertrophy. Interestingly enough though, again, at each one of these time points, they did an ultrasound measurement of muscle thickness. And when you look at the ultrasound data, it's not the same. You basically see that it increases instead of decreases along with the first block, comes down after during the 10-day period between the two blocks, comes back up at, during the second block, and then more or less stays the same or plateaus and dips slightly when you watch the 10-day period after the second block of training. So we see no delayed hypertrophy effect uh, in the whole muscle measures, looking at muscle thickness. And you have to ask yourself, well, well, what's going on here? And this isn't just an isolated study where, you know, we go, oh, you know, maybe the measurement error on the ultrasound wasn't good. Uh, I trust the, you know, the, the, the biopsies, which, which would be a fair call if that was just this one study. But like I said, there's the reanalysis of the high volume study, uh, which is a pretty crazy protocol. I think it's a really cool study. Even if you're not interested in this topic specifically, I do think you should go check it out. It's open access. It's by Van and colleagues, effects of high volume versus high load resistance training on skeletal muscle growth and molecular adaptations. It came out of uh, Dr. Mike Roberts' lab. Really cool. They basically had two groups. Uh, the more relevant group is probably the high volume group, so I'm not going to go through the whole study, but essentially they had a, a high load group and a high volume group that just had this increasing progressive stress that was applied, essentially overreaching via two different mechanisms um, in, in the two groups. So the high load group, they were doing three days a week of three by five training, right? And that's all that does this, the volume in terms of the actual sets and reps never changed. But throughout this six week period, they just increased the load from 82.5% of 1RM, 2.5% each week. So by the end of the study, they're doing three by five at 95% of 1RM, right? And grand, that's pre-test 1RM. So they got stronger. Not everyone might've been able to reach those reps. There was probably some load adjustment. I'd have to look at the methods, but again, that's just the, the high load group. And that's not necessarily uh, the one we're interested in, or I should say the high load leg. Cause this, I think was one leg did one, the other leg did the other design. So anyway, in the high volume leg, they started doing, they were doing sets of 10, always using 60% of 1RM, okay? And they just increased volume a lot. So across three days in the first week, they did five by 10, and they just added a set every single week so that by week six, they had literally doubled their volume on uh, the leg extensions. So, uh, and sorry, unilateral leg press and leg extension. So they were up to 10 sets of 10 on these exercises with 60% of 1RM compared to five by 10 at the start. So that's a, a fast rate of increases. You know, it's a set a week, right? 100% increase in volume in, in, in six weeks. And it's just a lot of volume in total, right? So interestingly enough, just like the Bjornsson study, they had measurements not only three days afterwards, like your typical time you amount of wait, the, the amount of time you wait for swelling to go down, but then also a period 10 days afterwards. And they looked at both MRI and ultrasound. These are whole muscle measures, okay? And there was, in uh, one head of the quadricep, a significant increase in the three days afterward measurement compared to the high load group, but that was the only significant difference. And in fact, there was not an increase at the 10 day post period. So just like we saw in Bjornsson, when you look at a whole muscle uh, data point with 10 days of training off, so, so no, nothing, 10 days of detraining, if you will, after an overreaching block, whole muscle hypertrophy did not occur. It didn't regress, but it was basically, we didn't see delayed hypertrophy at the whole muscle level. So the question here is, is well, well, what is happening? I think it would be a fair conclusion to look at this and go, well, listen, I don't care about whether inside of my muscle, my, my fibers are growing more, but if I'm, I'm trying to get yacked, right? If I'm not seeing whole muscle hypertrophy, I don't care. So clearly the conclusion is delayed hypertrophy doesn't happen and during deloads, you're, you're not growing, so it does make sense to cut calories. 
But I think it's really important to think about what's the difference between 10 days off from training completely and your typical deload, which is most of the time when I see online a one-third to two-third reduction in volume, depending on how much you overreached. We'll just keep it simple and say you cut your volume in half, right? That's certainly enough to maintain anything and not see a backsliding. Uh, while we do know that time off from training will eventually result in backsliding. And we have to ask ourselves the question, why did Bjornsson observe myofiber-specific hypertrophy, but not whole muscle? And then we have to think, well, okay, what's the difference in those measures, right? The whole muscle is measuring just the size of it. So if there's different changes in it. So for example, if you take a bunch of days off training, you're going to lose some muscle glycogen. You're going to lose some, some water that's associated with that. Swelling is going to come down as well. And if you were to do a deload, the loss in muscle glycogen uh, would be less. And I think muscle swelling reductions would probably be the same. So it is very possible that what's actually happening during deloads and could have been happening, and I can't claim that it was because they, they don't have the measurement, in this VAN study, the reanalysis of the high volume protocol, looking at these whole muscle measures, it's possible that there was an increase in the fiber-specific hypertrophy while whole muscle was going down due to, say, water losses, swelling going down, as well as uh, losses of muscle glycogen and other things that we wouldn't care about due to detraining, right? Or that there might have been two competing signals there because the detraining was so long. But that might be different during a deload. I think it is actually possible, and we should probably entertain the idea, that there could be some hypertrophy going on after you've dealt with the muscle damage, you've, you've dealt with the quote-unquote fatigue, if you want to speak broadly. So if we're overreaching, the general concept in sports science is that we're going to see delayed adaptations. While we ha don't have clear evidence in hypertrophy, we have reason to believe it could be happening, and it certainly does happen for performance. So if your goal is hypertrophy, and if you're expecting, because you're overreaching during your deload, to see some delayed adaptation does it really make sense to slash your calories while you have a potential to grow? And that's the question that I ask is if the goal is recovery with the potential to grow, does that seem like the right time to cut your calories conceptually? Eric, this is a smoking gun. I'm, I'm just going to do a quick calculation here uh, to basically justify why I don't look like, look like Ronnie Coleman. So every 10 to 12 weeks, I take that two week deload reintroduction week. I'm in a caloric deficit. Let's suppose that I was cutting off some of my gains two weeks of that. So I do it every 10 to 12 weeks. So thus every single year, there's roughly eight weeks of me being in an unnecessary potential deficit. You multiply that over, you know, six, seven years. We're now looking at about an entire year off of training. And as we know, Eric, from my point right now to what I would need to look like Ronnie Coleman, it's about a year. Um, so basically- yeah, and you're getting yeah. about a pound a week on average yeah. of muscle. Yeah. So that's yeah. 50, 52 pounds. What do you currently weigh? Uh, 183. You know, it's funny, even at a pound a week, it wouldn't, it wouldn't add up. Probably no, 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 like, no, no. Cause you'd, you'd, you'd be 230. Right. Right. Natural. Right. Yeah. And yeah. If then, yeah. Then if you, if you were on, on gear, yeah. basically Ronnie Coleman, you know? No. Absolutely. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Okay. So it's still possible. I apologize. So a few things, cause Eric, we, we do have to dive right into this. I was, I, uh, my first thing that astonished me when you brought this up was Bjornsson. Just the fact that half Thor Bjornsson contributes to science and no one is aware of this. Everyone just sees him as the strongman competitor, the person on Game of Thrones, the mountain and some shitty commercials. Meanwhile, he's just like in the bunker <laughs> conducting this very necessary research. Eric, I think is one of the unsung heroes of this whole tale. You know, I'm just impressed at the time management um, <laughs> right. because he's got a lot. He's got a lot of time spent with the trainer, learning to become a world class boxer and MMA fighter. One. In addition to maintaining uh, his his strongman performance, and he also has to be on social media talking shit all the time. Yeah. And conducting <laughs> research. Right. So he has basically like four full time jobs, and uh, so hats off. So Eric. yeah. Eric, so, I, but in all seriousness, yeah, yeah there's a. I, I think this is just something to consider that there is an argument to be made for maybe this isn't the time that makes sense to be cutting calories, at least not drastically. Yeah. Um, again, we don't have direct research on this. I'm not trying to, you know, be hyperbolic or claim like I do not have data showing, hey, during a deload like you do, you grow and it's hindered if you cut your calories. Right. I don't have that. So I'm really not making any confident claims. But I think just if we're going to be using these some of these sports science principles as guiding you know, approaches in the absence of this evidence, I just don't think it makes sense to cut your calories significantly during a deload, right? Eric. 
Yes, sir. Question for you then, because we're talking now synchronicity, like the pairing of your caloric consumption to obviously your training and this concept of delayed hypertrophy that might be occurring. You outlined why on a deload with things like muscle glycogen being preserved, why it's still possible. Can you talk to us then about the timing then of your nutrition where people understand that it's not a one-to-one, -one. like you ingest your protein, you have your calories for the day, boom, it goes right to that slab of muscle that you want to build. There is a uh, the time course is slightly different. Can you talk us through then uh, the matching of these two timelines of you do a training, so you uh, incur some sort of damage, you recover, it grows over time, that's a timeline, and then you ingesting nutrition, so a certain amount of calories at X point will affect at Y point in time. Can you just talk about those two time courses then, like how they would maybe line up? Absolutely. I think it is generally... I think because we look at discrete time points in sports science, we measure things that we can measure, um, not the things we can't. And sometimes we make assumptions about the existence of things we can't measure. Mm. Um, that sometimes we have probably inaccurate ideas of when and how things are operating. I do think based upon different, you know, bringing different threads of data together, that there is probably a more complex and time intensive process going on with skeletal muscle adaptation and morphological changes than maybe we appreciate and how it relates to nutrition. So, I mean, just the simple fact of what we're seeing here in Bjornsson means that a stimulus that happened almost two weeks ago is now seeing a, a response at the myofiber level and a little more growth in one fiber than another type. Not much, but it's interesting. It's also some of the only evidence we have of it's among some of the evidence we have of, you know, fiber type specific hypertrophy. Although when you look at the data, it looks like type one and type two are growing. So it, it just gives us an idea that there's a little more complexity here. There's also a study by DeMoss and colleagues where they looked at, again, untrained individuals, but for a much longer period. And they were looking at uh, MPS changes through a, a relatively advanced technique where they actually do biopsies and then also changes in hypertrophy over time. And they did a some, some analyses where they would try to correlate uh, MPS with hypertrophy, and they found that the initial MPS scores did not predict long-term hypertrophy. But when you, they, they had, they had a, a method of trying to correct for the MPS that they thought was related to muscle damage, when they did that, then it did predict it. So it's kind of like this idea that there is a priority system and some degree of memory with the way you adapt, right? So that, okay, you get a stimulus, and we already know this is truth in the repeated bout effect. And this lasts a long ass time. Like if you did RDLs three months ago, you would actually have a little less muscle damage if you did them three months, months later, and you'd have even less muscle damage if you did them like the week prior. But there's a difference there. So we, we clearly get these adaptations that make us more resilient to muscle damage and, and the experience of DOMS that can last months, you know, uh, a relatively long period of time. And we also are having not clear, super not super clear human data, but slightly more clear animal data, of the the concept of muscle memory. You know, the idea that you maintain, uh, you know, the, the myonuclei from prior training so that you can hypertrophy e easier uh, when you return to training after a layoff. And we have data also showing that that when you compare groups that train regularly versus groups that train in spurts, they end up getting to a similar place because when they come back after some after a layoff they grow a little bit faster than they otherwise would have, kind of showing that potential muscle memory uh, facet in action. The specific mechanisms, uh, we thought we were, we were a little more firm on them, you know, a couple of years ago than we are today, but the existence of that happening is real. So then to your question more directly is how does that interact with what we do with nutrition and training? And if you have training that overlaps and creates a lot of muscle damage in the same muscle groups, uh, or if you have you know, a low protein intake or a high protein intake, or you're in a deficit or a surplus, which impacts muscle protein synthesis and the availability to fuel that process, um, you could delay some of these, the, these adaptations or make them smaller. And we only kind of get glimpses of that at kind of a higher level. Like, oh, we have meta-analyses showing there's a, a small effect size favoring over X amount of protein compared to lower which is probably interacting somewhere with, with, with one or many of these processes, right? Um, so I think that is kind of generally just a, a word of caution to people to not put too much proximal emphasis on what is happening right now, temporally, like in a, you know, a time-related sense. This is, uh, you know, we see echoes of this, like it's not the end of the world if you missed your, your post-workout protein shake, you know? 
Uh, it may not even be the end of the world if you if you push yourself to the point of non-functional you know, overreaching. You might make that up on the back end a couple months from now. I don't know. I don't actually know the limits of this or the degree that it matters. Um, but I, I think it is useful to have a little bit of humility and understand that there are mechanisms for morphological adaptation that seem to have some type of memory. Um, and we probably want to have that as a consideration when we think about what do we do nutritionally. Um, so, yeah. Eric, now, if we want to be hyper-specific, I was thinking about this, that if we agree, okay, maybe being in a caloric deficit may not be optimal as it relates to hypertrophy when in a deload. At the same time, if we're trying to have a, a relatively narrow band of a surplus, when we do a deload, we do have less total work we're doing. So what should be our caloric intake compared to before? But the part that's interesting, I think that you're going to get to is, I think people overestimate the don't know, maybe that don't listen to iron culture, the total amount of calories you expend when you live. Like people, like you, you, you hear these figures, I burn 800 calories in this workout. It's like, it's not like that. But what is true is let's say it's a 50% reduction. So instead of six times training a week, uh, three times, and then the total amount of volume, like what would that look like? So if we agree, you can't, you shouldn't be we'll in a get deficit. There, yeah, yeah. Yeah, th we'll definitely get there. And, and, and to, to kind of uh, spoil the plot, this may not matter, <laughs> you know, <laughs> like you need to maybe not worry about this so much. It's, it's, it's an interesting intellectual exercise and a, maybe an opportunity to more better understand some of the theories and principles and therefore the applications. But I think with the kind of volumes that most people are doing and the way deloads look in relation to their normal training, this may not matter. And we can actually do some calculations and, and quantify that roughly, which I'll do live <laughs> a week later on the air. Um, so I think it's also worth talking about, like for all the, the, the strength boys and gals who might be turning out, tuning out right now, because I'm talking about hypertrophy. Like we, we do also do deloads after phases where we're overreaching in a strength phase, like kind of like the other group in that van study, where maybe we're not expecting, you know, robust uh, hypertrophy adaptations. We're expecting, you know, neuromuscular adaptations or just, you know, trying to basically recover from just grinding on heavy ass weights. And maybe it's a bit of a, uh, you know, more soft tissue recovery and mental recovery. You need to actually like heal some, some, some minor ouchies, you know, um, you're like, okay, well, what about in my case, if I'm not coming off of a high, you know, a high volume block? Well, basically what we can do there is lean on the tapering research, which tapering, for those who don't know, it's basically a reduction in volume, more aggressive than a deload while maintaining a high level of specificity, high load, right? Uh, and then peaking performance. So this would be what you would do before a very serious testing or potential competition. And that looks a lot different uh, because not only are you doing a taper that's low volume, it's also coming off of typically a lower volume periodized approach where you're being more specific. Like, yeah, it's maybe a lot of singles, doubles, triples, but there's only so much you can accumulate when you're working at like 85% of 1RM to 95% of 1RM for most of your training. Yep. So there's a pretty cool study that just kind of highlights the point that tapers aren't deloads. Uh, when you look at this study by Travis and colleagues titled Preparing for a National Weightlifting Championship, a case series. And it's two national level U.S. weightlifters who uh, were preparing for USAW nationals, a female and a male. And they had a number of really cool metrics they looked at. So they looked at their typical change and their rate of rate of uh, rate of difference, like the, the typical error of measurement and their normal variability. And they tracked it over time with some very cool metrics. One, they were actually looking at uh, like changes in muscle size of like the quadriceps. They also looked at jump height and they also looked at like rate of force development jumping on a force plate. And I've talked about this before on Iron Culture, but really importantly, the point like right around the, the few days right closest to their competition and the day of the competition was when you saw the highest or second highest values in both lifters for their rate of force development and their jump height, which are pretty solid proxies for snatch, clean and jerk. So they were ready to compete. However, at the exact same time, they were also on a trend downward in terms of their, their muscle morphology. So they looked like they were at least whole muscle size was going down while they were their strongest. And I think it's important to understand that like a deload and a taper are similar, but they serve different purposes. So a deload follows overreaching and it precedes more training. And it's typically coming after a higher volume or a hypertrophy block, not always, but you know, important in this context, that's what we're discussing. And the goal is to allow recovery without backsliding. It's not necessarily to peak, right? You might be a little stronger at the end of a deload, but that's, that's not necessarily the goal. That's an indication that your fatigue is down. And the taper also follows overreaching, 
but it comes after intensity and strength blocks, right? And it precedes testing and competing. So the goal is to peak regardless if some qualities, I would argue, necessarily backslid. Because you can't just be at your biggest and your strongest at the same time. You can maintain a reasonably high level of both, but if you want to peak either, then you have to specialize a little more. So almost by definition, we know that a taper is different than a deload, and it doesn't matter that they might have lost a little size, apparently, at least at the whole muscle level, while they're also at their strongest. That might just be what's required because of the opportunity cost of doing more specific work and dumping fatigue more aggressively so that performance is at its highest. Because there's so many things that contribute to strength. And we've talked about that before, so I won't belabor the point. Yeah. So that's they're not the same, and I think it probably would make sense uh, to actually reduce your calories during a taper because it's a more aggressive cut in, in calories. And oftentimes, it's happening at the exact same time as what? When you're trying to make weight anyway. So mm -hmm. if we're talking about most except for one weight class in both the men's and women's division for uh, weightlifting and powerlifting are people who are weight class restricted. So um, it may make sense. It might fit into part of your strategy to have a slight reduction in calories, uh, account for the fact that you're, you're burning less calories, same kind of rationale, but this time it's actually true. Yeah, a taper, we actually do have observations of muscle loss. You are doing far less stimulus for muscle growth uh, and you're cutting your calories and you actually do want to lose weight. So you don't want to do it too aggressively because you do want to dump fatigue, but it, I think it does make sense during a taper for your calories to go down a little bit. And you're typically actually training fewer days as well. Tapers look a little more aggressive than deloads in general. So I think during a taper, it does make sense to kind of do what most people are proposing during deloads. But I do want to point out that difference. Um, and then the last point, and this will be super minor, another similar thing to a deload or a taper is an introductory week. Uh, introductory weeks are also supposed to be relatively easy weeks. But intros, they follow different or easier training. They don't follow overreaching like a taper or a deload. They're to prepare you for what's coming. So you do an intro week because maybe you just came off of a competition or a high volume block, uh, or sorry, a high intensity block, and you want to go into a high volume block. And you're not trying to dump a bunch of muscle damage on yourself because you're going from, you know, an average of six sets of five on average or something like that to now doing 12 sets of 10. Like that would blow you up pretty quick. <laughs> So you do something in between the two and then also pull back the RPE. So let's say let's say that's what you that's what you want to do. And this is not a recommendation, this example. You want to go from six by five at an average RPE of eight to, and to 12 by 10 at an average RPE of eight, right? You would probably do something like eight sets of eight at an RPE of six or seven. And then you would be far less beat up. I mean, it's still an extreme example, but the point is, is it's a bridge between the two to try to make it so that you have some element of adaptation, the repeated bout effect, so that the the, uh, the week following the intro week doesn't blow you up. But it's still an easy week, you know, like the loads are going to feel light, um, you're not going to be close to failure, and you might get some soreness, but it's really not going to beat you up too much. And in fact, your energy expenditure might actually go up. So this is an indication of, yes, it's an easier week of training than like your hardest intensity week, but it's it's, it's hard for a different reason, but it's not hard. So it's relatively easy, but it is actually a pretty large increase in volume. So should you cut calories? Probably not. This is, an, 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 if anything, you might increase them a little bit. But I think, yeah, bef before I start telling people increase or decrease or keep calories the same, yeah. I think it really is important to talk about the point you were making of like, how much does this matter? So that's that's where we are. Now we've, we've finished the science segment and now we can talk pragmatically. How's that sound, Omar? It sounds fantastic. I just feel terrible for everyone that has to cut weight. As you know, Eric, I am a light super heavy. Uh, people may not like this, but this is what peak performance looks like. Everyone else, taper week, they have to watch what their calories are. Oh, two hour way in, blah, 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 blah. Meanwhile, I'm eating up into the competition. Okay, the coefficient might be going down, but the raw number, as we know, what only matters in uh, the jungle, there's no weight the classes. Yep. Yeah, yeah. Uh, is the raw weight that you lift. Um, so that that that's interesting for i guess everyone else but of course there's that's why nuance context is important in the individual so thank you for specifying for that one weight class no it's a good point and i think for those who do compete in the jungle yeah. i think you can probably disregard this and, and most of our podcasts to be honest <laughs> um but uh for those who are competing at a at a competition or a meet on the platform and you do have a weigh-in yeah. um then this this might be relevant so you know horses for courses as they say <laughs> 
so anyway, uh, Pragmatism. how much does this matter? Yeah. Like, like how much, like, or how many calories are we burning here? What are we talking about? Yeah. Um, there was a pretty good study by uh, Little and colleagues in 2019 titled "Predicting the Energy Expenditure of an Acute Resistance Exercise Bout in Men and Women," and they basically created this regression equation. So it's basically like a correlation. You can see it plotted like x and y axis. Uh, it's you know predicted kcal energy expenditure and actual. Um, with these people who, who trained, and it's pretty strong, you know, like it explains close to 80% of the variance. And in this equation is height, weight, sex, and volume performed. Mm. Now, this is a group level regression. Now, if we apply it to an individual, few of those variables don't change. I mean, they can, and I would support you if you wanted to change them. But probably from last week to this week, I would argue that your uh, your body composition is not going to be that different. Your height should be the same, and you probably have the same sex. So the big variable that changes from going from week to week of training is your volume of training. Mm. And indeed, on an individual level, the best predictor for your energy expenditure is the volume of training. And I do mean like uh, volume load, like sets times reps times load, because it's basically within an individual, you don't have to worry about work from the perspective of displacement or, or distance traveled to the barbell because you're using the same range of motion, same movement. So you could just, in a similar program, calculate your tonnage, and that would be a rough relative comparison, not an absolute representation of what would be the difference in energy expenditure. So if you cut your volume in half energetically on the same program, you would expect that session to be burning half as many calories. And if you burn a crap ton of calories in a session, that might be a problem, right? But the reality is you just don't. Yeah. So um, in this study, uh, they basically had a range of roughly 75 to a little, little over 300 calories burned per workout. So let's say, we'll, we'll take an extreme example. Not an extreme example, maybe a representative example. Someone doing a lot of volume, working hard, and training five days per week. Let's say 200 calories per session, training five days a week. That's 1,000 calories in your normal training. So if you did a deload where you cut your volume in half, you're burning 500 less calories per week. That sounds like a big deal. That's like your whole deficit on a single day, right? But it's not on a single day. That's for the whole week. So we're talking about 70 calories per day or half a large banana. So it's it's just not that much, which I think is a really thing, really really important thing to point out. Um, and on top of that, it is probably in some cases not a direct one to one. Omar, do you remember when we did our episode like all about cardio? Hmm. Terrible episode, yes. Yeah, it was. It was. It was informative. As a, I meant more ideological. But terrible. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I mean, I I hate that we had to speak on that, but you know, this whole for all lifters things isn't only upsides. Yep. It also has downsides. Apparently, people do do cardio. Yep. Um, and what I said right before the word cardio is how I feel about it. Yep. Do do. Yep. So, um, nonetheless, there was an important point that I did make in that all about cardio episode, and that is about understanding the constrained model of energy expenditure. So this has become popularized and probably hyperbolically so by the book Burn and kind of the general uh, populace. The science, though, when you look at it, and which provides a more nuanced and more uh, objective and accurate definition, is that when you see very, very high levels of physical activity, you don't see a linear additive predicted increase in total daily energy expenditure. It still increases, though, but there is some degree of quote-unquote compensation from other aspects of energy expenditure. So just keep it like really simple. Think of it this way. If you have your, your general physical activity and then you have all other elements of energy expenditure, and, you know, as one goes up, it would you think it'd just be like a one-to-one -one increase? And it's probably not once you get to the high levels of physical activity. So again, we're talking about deloads. You're always overreaching, presumably, and we'll talk about why you might not be, before you do a deload. Overreaching means that you're doing higher volume, higher stress. It is very possible that during your overreaching period, you're experiencing a bit of a constrained effect on your total daily energy expenditure. You might not be actually going up in your, in your energy expenditure as much as you'd expect. Like if we were to go back to that van study, I'm not fully convinced that when they were doing 10 by 10 on leg extension and leg curls that they were actually burning twice as twice many calories in the whole day, in the session, sure, compared to when they're doing 5 by 10 on the two. Because that's such a large increase in energy expenditure, it might be that, to put it simply, they were tired for the rest of the day. They were a little more sedentary. And that is what we observe uh, when we start looking at high levels of physical activity. So you very well could be going, depending upon your model of training and how high your volume got, from your overreaching week the week prior to your deload, burning less total calories than you'd predict 
uh, when the whole day is accounted for because of the constrained model. And then you go to something that is not constrained because you've reduced your volume. So the difference between the two would be even less. So now it's not half of a large banana. Now we're talking about, you know, 20 calories less per day, half of a, a medium banana, you know, on, on, on your probably macro factor app instead of my fitness pal these days, which I hurts me to admit, but it's, you know, it's probably what, what you're using. So anyway, the point being, these are really small differences. And if you're not training five days a week and if you're not burning 200 calories per session, let's say you're a little more casual in your, in your training, it, it's even less than that. So in my mind, the only time when you consider all these factors that it really makes sense to reduce your calories because you're doing something deload-esque is actually when you're tapering or in one other instance. And I think, I don't know, would you say this is fair, Omar? Because you, you're more connected to the casual, non-committed, on and off detrained, um, really kind of lost in their lifting experience lifter that that doesn't really listen to iron culture, but that you represent. The polar and me who's lifter. connected to the yeah, you know, the people who identify with the idea of being a lifter but yeah. don't lift that much. Yeah. You guys take deloads too. It's most of the time it's just called every other week. Um, but for logistical reasons, for uh, vacations, holidays, uh, work gets busy. In all seriousness, I was kidding. Like most people are not necessarily deloading because they just overreach. That's an athlete thing, it's a bodybuilder thing, it's a powerlifter thing. I will say that this question online, it might not be fitting the premise of what I've posed. Like there's a lot of people who are probably doing a deload, which to them means like, oh man, like the kids, both kids are off school and I've got a lot of work to do. Uh, I'm only gonna train twice this week or I'll make this week my deload even though it wasn't what was planned. Or the holidays are coming up, I'm only gonna be able to get two sessions in. Should I cut my calories? And I think in these instances, there is an argument there because now the, origi the original assumptions that the question asker makes are true. Like you weren't just overreaching and now you're not going to be expecting any potential for delayed hypertrophy. You just came off of like week three of a, of a, like a six week block. So you're in like kind of a middling level of, of stress. And now you're just training twice a week instead of four times. Yeah, you probably want to cut your calories a little bit. How much? Again, it's probably not going to matter that much. We're talking like maybe 50 calories a day. So the question is, is do you think that you have that level of precision with your tracking and then does it matter or just carry on, you know? Yeah. As we saw with uh, Mr. Dr. Ben House, where he said, you know, I have a PhD in this. I've been tracking my calories for 15 years. And the, he had the humility to say that there's probably a band of about 150 calories. He would estimate about a 10% variance in terms of what he thinks he's eating and what potentially he actually ingested for the day. And if you think about the amount that you're now saying, potentially if you do a deload uh, in terms of when you average it out for the week, how many fewer calories you're expending doesn't really make a lot of sense i do like i will say that the my favorite the unplanned deload which is like you just go for it somehow injure yourself then you're out of the gym or do some such thing uh usually is followed actually by some compensatory eating to make yourself feel better so if anything you're in like this hyper surplus um and you justify it as you got to feed the muscles because you got to make sure you're not wasting away um but i i do think it is an interesting question just in the sense that some people if you as you've described before eric the uh, j curve of kind of activity that people as they uh, are less active so let's say they're training less maybe such as myself you walk to the gym so now instead of six times per week if you're going three times per week that also means that on those three other days you're not walking which actually you walk 45 minutes there you walk 45 minutes back so that's an hour and a half so instead of doing you 10,000 steps you're actually doing 1,000 steps um now your expenditure can actually be a, a good deal less and yes. uh, may, maybe there might be some considerations like that but like you know it depends upon the person absolutely and there there are certainly situations i can i can think of where there are going to be large swings in energy expenditure we wouldn't expect you know delayed super compensation quote unquote uh with with any kind of morphological adaptation so it's not a big thing and yeah you might want to cut your calories but i think um in most cases even if we like it, it it doesn't really make sense conceptually and it doesn't matter in terms of the actual amount so you're you're probably not hurting yourself if you are cutting your calories a little bit but if you're doing something more drastic and like you're in a deficit during that week cuz you are cutting your calories by a couple hundred um then yeah that that's might not be ideal but i think uh another way to frame this to kind of get people to basically chill out cuz i don't think they should worry about this that much is like what what if the worst case scenario was true 
What if you were in a 500 calorie surplus and it all got stored as fat? What are we talking about here? Well, it's one seventh of a pound of fat. So it's really not that much. And that's assuming all of it got stored as fat, which I really don't think would be the case. So yeah, the general thing I see when people ask this question, my, my first thought is they probably have some other assumptions about what level of detail is beneficial that I would question and that they might actually be doing more harm than good with that kind of hair splitting. Hmm. And then when I when I think about it, like, okay, let, let's say this is someone who is a, an athlete or a bodybuilder and there's someone who is about that life and it's not you know, negatively impacting them. Let's say they're a competitive bodybuilder asking this question. I think that's a, a much more reasonable question in those contexts. Well, then you probably are even more likely overreaching and you probably don't want to cut calories. So either from a pragmatic perspective yeah. or a, uh, a like a principle-based perspective, and depending on which camp you're in, I think this is probably not one of those ones where it makes a lot of sense to do what's typically recommended um, and you know drastically slash your calories or, 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 or be in a deficit or, or make sure you're like as close to maintenance as possible on deload weeks if you're doing a deload for the reasons which you know a sports scientist would assume you are. So... Now, That's all I got, Omar. But hey, I, it's, 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 a, it's an easy question, yeah. but a relatively nuanced topic. Yeah. And I hope it was at least interesting to people to kind of un, unpack the uh, the more minute elements of it. 100%. And I think at the very least, uh, people, uh, something that probably happens during a deload, uh, it's an issue of control, uh, where mm. even if it's not important in quotations in terms of the magnitude of oh, the end effect, knowing what to do in a time when you have less control or structure uh, in your week, where like a deal though, like probably, right, like when you're locked in, you're training five to six times a week, it gives you uh, a, a schedule, it frames kind of your week. When you're deloading, then it's like, well, wait a second, like, does this even matter? So on and so forth. And it's okay to know that, you know, at the end, like you probably shouldn't be in a deficit, uh, basically eat at maintenance or eat at what you've been eating before. Um, uh, don't sweat it too much, but it's nice to know all the steps to get there to the final answer rather than just knowing the final an answer. So it tethers you uh, to a, a firmer belief in terms of what you're doing. So on the surface, it seems like, yeah, like that's an obvious answer, but you work your way through it. And then I do think for those people that are inclined to know, it is entirely relevant, 100%. Yeah. And one of the reasons I actually wanted to do this topic is that Previously, I was probably too dismissive when people asked this question in my career. Like five, six years ago, I would see maybe another podcast, um, like bring up this topic and talk about it, and I would roll my eyes. Like people shouldn't worry about this. Yeah. But then, that's kind of dismissive of people, or ironically, are like me, like a competitive bodybuilder who is trying to, like they have the the, the headspace and the reason to cross eyes and dot t's. I yep. think that's what you do with with uh, those letters. Yes. Um, and. Uh, <laughs> And they're like, well, I, I know it doesn't matter a lot or for most people, but it might matter a little bit for me. Yeah. So so I think actually providing the rationale as to why I don't think it matters might actually help be helpful more than just the answer because the answer can come across as dismissive. So yeah. anyway, for those who uh, ever felt dismissed, I acknowledge you, I apologize, and now you know why. Hey, never dismiss curiosity because at least you can work through the steps and then you could say, and so you see, it doesn't matter. As opposed to saying, like, why are you asking? Because, like, the the answer begets then, like, the, the hidden agenda of, like, like, why are you asking this question? You know, as opposed to, like, it's, exactly. o it's okay to be curious. And it's good, it's good to want to know. Um, and now you know. It doesn't matter. knowing is half the battle. Yeah. <laughs> Eric, anything you want to say uh, in closing for this uh, episode? Nothing. I'm done. I've said it. I've apologized. I've slandered. I've, I've unslandered. I've slandered myself. Yeah. Uh, I've discussed HR, we've had it removed, yep. and then I talked about a smokescreen topic on uh, something about deloads. So <laughs> yeah. we're good. Yeah, we had we had this whole what they don't know. We had this whole other topic, but we just like we went in panic mode. I was like, what is something that you know people can listen to? They they won't see what happened behind the iron curtain of us, the HR department, just like our text on screen, the TikTok, like they communicate to us via TikTok. Um, I'm not sure what the dance meant, but all I could assume is that it was catastrophic for our careers. Um, HR, they simply weren't happy. So we're just like, what is a topic we could do that's not only inoffensive, but even the people that are interested in the end, there's a zero possibility of suing us. And it was this topic. Yeah. 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 So I will say uh, to everyone listening, 
We appreciate you listening to another episode of Iron Culture, where you find out things, you fuck around and find out, and today you found out about Adilos and nutrition therein and things like tapering, what is the difference also with a taper, uh, what is the context when uh, you should think about these things, and then also... At the end, it's okay to ask questions around here with Iron Culture. So go ahead, drop that comment in the comment section down below. Go ahead and leave a rating and review. Typically on iTunes, people leave five stars. We'll allow you to reach your own conclusion. And we're back every single Monday from now until the end of time. We'll catch you in that next episode. Peace.